thank you all for joining us this evening. The, the purpose really of this video is simply to put to rest a, a continual tirade of unnecessary criticism, abuse and confusion in relation to some of the teaching which we've been aware of in relation to David Nathan since August this year. Some of the teaching does go back um, prior to that, but it came to prominence from August this year. I'm not here to, to beat up David nor any of the contributors tonight. We simply want to let the Bible speak and that the Lord's word is heard to this and the people will actually listen to this with an objective mind and let the Bible itself be the judge and advocate in relation to these issues. Not personal friendship, not emotion, not who you think is nasty or who you think is the quietest, whatever marking system you put on this, we need to set all this aside and we simply need to deal with the issues themselves. So we have Pastor Bill, Han Bill, Bill Randall's with us tonight from Believers in Grace, we have John Haller and we have Pastor Ian Huxham from CMFI. Guys, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Pastor Bill, if I can just start with you. Um, we're all well aware of issues and the videos that have gone through from then. And if anyone hasn't seen it, they must have been in Mars or away on holiday for a long period of time. But we're all aware of this. We're not going to spend too much time going back over it. But I just want to deal with some of these issues, Bill, and just to ask you to respond where the Lord leads you and where your heart and your voice feels that we should actually answer this. Just the first question I suppose that we need to answer and set the, the things off, really. We can look at scriptures. And say, I'm not going to give you any scriptures. I don't want to be seen to be promoting you in one direction or trying to coerce you in your conclusion that you do want to give. I want you to speak freely. So, in, in relation to what David has taught, the blood of Jesus, to me, is the most serious of the issues. And the fact that David has taught in relation to the end signs, the understanding that I'm getting from David's teaching is he's saying that the blood, is no, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is no longer sufficient in that millennium era and is replaced or superseded by the sacrifice of animals. So we are going back to that Levitical situation and the Lord himself, his blood from Calvary has of no value. Is that the way you understand David putting it across and what does the Bible say in response to that bill? Okay. All right, then, basically, in all fairness to David, I do not hear him saying that people now currently saved by the blood will suddenly find that the blood of Jesus does them no good. What I do hear him saying is that from the time of the millennium on, no one will be saved. Right. By the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ, as he said, will profit nobody anything. Now this is very disturbing because any kind of distortion on the topic of the blood of Jesus is a serious issue. Any deviation from it affects the doctrine of salvation. So therefore, this has been a very, very valid uh, public discussion. In relation to David's perspective on this then, Bill, would there be some who would call this teaching heretical or just simply very serious? Well, I believe that uh, it certainly is heretical, um, and I agree with Jacob in his first response, who said, I don't think that you're a heretic, but you're in danger of being one. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is an innovation on the blood of Jesus. That's a serious thing. This is an innovation on salvation and the means of salvation. So we could, we, definitely it's a, her, a heresy. Would there then, as a, a, an add-on to that, would there be sufficient weight behind this whole proposition to say that David is actually creating an alternative Christ, therefore a different gospel, a different God? 
I don't know if I could go that far. I, I um, what David is being is 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 very is very dispensational. He's talking about a dispensation we haven't even entered into yet. Now I do think it's dangerous, and and I also think precision is very important for us. We got to be fair to him, and we got to be fair, and he's got to be fair to us. So, uh, no, I, I don't think that's a, a brand new Jesus. So my, you, my, in my view, uh, in, in relation to the sufficiency of, of script, the sufficiency of the Lord's blood, does it actually end? Is there a end point according to Scripture? It never ends. No, no, it's it's an eternity. But he, it says in the book of Hebrews 13, he cleanses by his blood with an eternal covenant. It goes on forever and ever. And the blood will never lose its power. Yeah. And, and salvation is forever. And, and perhaps most importantly and precisely, I cannot conceive of anyone at any dispensation ever being reconciled to God any other way but by the blood. The blood of Jesus is the only way to be saved. Now, Amos, from the perhaps... When the Lord goes into the tomb for three days, he goes back to see those old saints to confirm to them that their belief exactly. is the same. So it, is, it must simply be eternal from the beginning right through to the end. And, and by the way, yeah, right. You know, everyone since Adam was saved by the blood. Yeah. And everyone that will ever be saved is going to be saved by the blood. Amen, brother. But another, another very important point, if I may inject right here, is that there are two statements that David made that are very, very serious. The one is that the the blood will not profit anyone. The blood of Jesus will not profit anyone in the millennium. But perhaps even worse is the statement that animal sacrifices will be offered in the millennium. And Dave went out of his way to say that they are in no way commemorative. Yeah. That's the problem right there. Because when you say that, you disconnect them from the cross of Jesus Christ. What does the Bible itself say then, Bill, in relation to that memorial, that, that commemoration you're saying? What do we understand? Since, since the church age, what has been the accepted understanding of that sacrifice in the end time? Well, well, there's a couple of things about this that I want to say. Number one, all sacrifice of animals in the Old Testament was anticipatory. Yep. Our commemoration is the uh, bread and the wine. But what we're talking about is the a new dispensation, the millennium. Now, I want to say a few things, and maybe my colleagues will have more insight. Okay. But I don't even know for sure that it that Ezekiel's temple is millennial. Right. I don't know what it is. This is an obscure path. Yes, yes. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know if it's millennial or not. But I do know that no one can be cleansed other than by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. This is our greatest contention right here. Well, thank you for but, that. But, you know, we expect... It really does put the, the, the whole response across in a way that I hope people listening to this can actually understand. I mean, we, we can talk from now until the millennium, if you want, expanding on this and detailing it. But the important thing is that people understand is that what David has taught is serious error that's going to lead people astray, give them a false hope, and actually give people no hope. Well, Amos, uh, I'd also like to add that David could have cleared this all up within days of the controversy. It would be a very easy thing to do to give a satisfactory repudiation 
of what perhaps he said in haste. But I've not seen that. A lot of people in this controversy are telling me that David has cleared this all up. I don't know that I've ever seen any clip where he explains what he meant by the blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone. I, I, haven't, I, I haven't seen a repudiation nor an explanation. No, I've, I've heard him say that he's sorry he said things. But that's not the same thing as clearing it up. And a lot of us have urged him, in the name of Jesus and in the love of God, clear this up, David. No, you're absolutely right. The whole, I think that's an important message, is that the responsibility for this still lies with David. Uh, no one here is condemning him. Yes. No one here is ostracizing him. We leave all doors open, but he has got to walk through that door. He has got to seek the Lord in this, and he has got to address these issues with the Father in heaven. Exactly right. And and he's got to clear himself. And this is this is a serious thing, and no time for ambiguity. I mean, I think it would have been helpful. If David really did misspeak, to get up in public and say yeah. something like, I do not believe that the blood of Jesus Christ can in any way not profit someone at any time, nor do I believe that anyone could be cleansed, atoned, or reconciled to God other than by the blood of Jesus. That would have been it. Solved. Done. I don't think he's done it, and I don't think he wants to do it. <laughs> but, Bill, this, this is a sad issue. We, we all know David. We, we know him. We, we've, we've had fellowship with him. Sure. And yeah. This is why there's so, so much difficulty, because we can't see what the obstruction is. Where's the stubbornness come from? But the, the Lord knows. Right. The, the Lord will, unfortunately, have to humble him and bring him further, because the Lord loves him as well. I think so, and we all love him. And I count David as a friend. This is a great tragedy, okay? But he could have cleared it up. Yeah. David, you could have cleared this up, very simply. Unless, it is, unless it's true that you really do believe these things. Thank you, Bill. Let's turn now to Pastor Ian Huxham from CMFI. Ian... During this whole situation, CMFI uh, wanted to issue a, a clarification statement. Can you just talk us a little bit through that, if, if you wish, and then just explain the CMI uh, position as regards the whole situation on David's teaching? Yeah, of course. Um, first of all, I'm quite grateful for the opportunity, um, and I thank Bill for the explanation he's given, because that issue of the blood was the first thing, uh, of course, that we we heard about um, and when these things came to prominence. Um, from my point of view, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that um, from my own understanding, also from that of Christian Ministerial Fellowship International, because many people will know that we felt it was necessary to issue an internal statement, which we wish to keep private, just to explain our position to our own membership on this very issue, which was the first thing that came before us. Um, several people had been saying that it was a, a secondary issue because they were talking about um, the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ um, uh, uh, being effective during the millennium and, and that it wasn't particularly important. I, for one, speaking personally, took a very different view uh, than that, Amos, and, and that was quite simply that it's, it is absolutely paramount to our faith um, and the understanding of the gospel. And I know that Bill has spoken a lot about some of the scriptures and given a very thorough explanation. I don't have to add a great deal, a great deal to that, but um, we are aware that uh, in Revelation 14, 6, it tells us that it is an everlasting gospel. We're, we're very much aware, and I was always taught about the incorruptible things of God, um, 
one of which, of course, is the incorruptible blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the scriptures tell us that we're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. And that blood is incorruptible. Um, and it will never lose its power. Uh, Hebrews 7.27, Jesus died once for all. So the notion that it's a secondary issue that we, you know, we needn't take uh, issue with yeah. um, is entirely wrong in my opinion because it does undermine what I would consider to be fundamentals of the, of the gospel. Now, I have never once and neither have CMFI entered into the argument or debate about personalities or people. We purely wanted to keep this about doctrine and not about personality. Mm. That's why we made our statement private. That's why we've never issued any follow-up statement. That's why we've not accused anyone of anything and don't want to get into such accusations or, or personal um, slanging matches. But there are certain things that we do want to do, and that's just to clarify at CMFI that we do not hold with the teaching that the blood of Jesus will have no effect during the millennium. Uh, we, we, we believe that the gospel is very clear. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the um, incorruptible blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will never lose its power. Jesus died once for all. It's an everlasting gospel. So to my mind, and I think not only the council of CMFI, but also to the membership of CMFI, because we discuss these things at, at our annual conference, to suggest that the blood of Jesus would never be uh, or, or could possibly uh, lose its effectiveness um, really goes against the, the, the truth of the gospel in and of itself. So yeah. we felt very necessary at that point to make a statement. And as I say, to repeat myself, we decided that we would keep it internal just by way of advice to our membership, simply to say that there were issues that at that time were very much unresolved we had been made aware of them, and we thought pastorally, um, and certainly as a council of elders, that the wisdom was to say, because we didn't agree with them, until these matters were clarified, we couldn't endorse the ministry of those who were teaching such things. So that's that was the position of CMFI, based very much on, on the basis that we do believe that, that animal sacrifices in the millennium will be uh, a memorial, um, and the, the blood of Jesus, that he did indeed die once for all. Nothing ever would need to be added or taken away from his perfect finished work at Calvary. Amen to that, Ian. C can you just expand then on the term memorial? B Bill, Bill used the same um, terminology, but I just really want to explain to people what that actually means and what this millennium reign is at, at the end times and why when we read the scriptures when we're talking about that there will be animal sacrifice we're, we're not denying that but what we're saying is that that will never replace the eternal sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ but that animal sacrifice what's its purpose here? And as you understand the scripture what's it actually saying well, well when we talk about it being a memorial I suppose that the simplest thing the way that I can um, hopefully clarify things f for people I in answer to your question is that we have a memorial meal right now as believers yeah. until Jesus comes again we have a more memorial meal right now in our own fellowship in Sidmouth Evangel Church we partake of the Lord's Supper uh, every time we meet together on a Sunday morning um, simply because we believe it's an ordinance of the church and the Lord said do this in remembrance of me you know as often as you come together do this in remembrance yeah. of me so when we meet we take the Lord's Supper now that's a memorial do this in remembrance of me so for us we are remembering at that point the finish um, uh, work of, of the cross so we we, we are uh, remembering all, all that Christ Jesus has done for us and and similarly I, I think um, that when we come to that you, you talked about the the millennium of course I'm sure that most of your viewers will understand that but we uh, very much believe that there will be a literal um, thousand year reign yeah. uh, Lord Jesus Christ you know what will come back so of course the, the again those things will point to his sacrifice uh, the once and for all sacrifice and as I said that's Hebrews 7 27 that Jesus died once for all there's nothing that those uh, that the blood of those animals um, 
uh, can actually do to add to the complete work of Jesus Christ. But they will serve as a memorial to keep in mind um, his perfect sacrifice um, for all. Ian, thank you for that. What, what I take from this, and, I, and I, I understand it this way, and it's more or less parallel with what you're saying, is that these are bedrocks of our salvation. They are the hope made manifest in that eternal reign, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. If we misunderstand this, then really it allows us to be encouraged by so much other error. If Jesus' blood has paid the price for our sins in this generation and also paid the sins for those in the Adamic era up until when the Lord himself went to the cross. So it's back, it's current and it's future. It's everlasting, never ending well, as his love is for us. Yeah, exactly what Revelation 14, 6 says. He calls it an everlasting gospel uh, and our point is the salvation through faith in Christ is an eternal truth. Salvation through faith in Christ is an eternal truth, and he died once and for all. Uh, as I said earlier, we're, we're not redeemed with um, silver and gold, corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the incorruptible, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's nothing can be added or taken away. Does this suggest that this is a secondary issue because it's sometime future in the millennium and that we, you know, we don't know and we can't know and, you know, maybe... We're, it's not the issue at all from, from my point of view. The issue from my point of view is um, where is our faith right now uh, in Jesus and the blood of Jesus? And, and to suggest that at some point it may not be enough completely undermines our faith, um, in my opinion. Well, maybe if I could relate just a brief story as to uh, my studying this in more depth a number of years ago uh, a lady approached me at church one sunday with a book by and i don't really care to go into the name of a fairly well-known christian theologian and she said there's something in this book that's very disturbing to me and i can't figure it out i i don't understand it so i pulled the quote uh and actually consulted with jacob about it and started digging into it and researching a bit and the quote in the book said essentially that when this temple in the 70th week is rebuilt, it will be uh, the sacrifices offered in the temple will be valid sacrifices. Now, I had sort of heard this. I dealt in, I, I, I dived into it. And in some, at some places in the dispensational community, there is a teaching that uh, in the 70th week, the, the, the gospel, the, the way people are saved will be different. Uh, sometimes they call these people ultra-dispensationalists, but the person who had written this in his book was not an ultra-dispensationalist. And I had heard, having grown up in dispensational churches, I had heard some elements of this teaching, but they always seemed to me to be disconnected from what the Bible actually said. The the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, saved by grace through faith. The great treatise of Romans chapter 4, where Paul talks about being Abraham and being saved by faith. The great faith chapter of Hebrews chapter 11. And then the passages in Hebrews that talk about the, that the work of Jesus Christ is, it is, it is full, it is complete, it is absolute, it is, it is the gospel and the way people are saved from the time of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the shedding of his blood. It is the way people are saved throughout the rest of time. Jesus from the cross said, it is finished. The opening verses of Hebrews say that Jesus finished his work and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapters 8, 9, 10 talk about the, the ultimate perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. So I have to view all of the rest of Scripture through that light and through that revelation. 
the only conclusion I can come to is that to the extent that there are sacrifices, and it does say there will be sacrifices in the millennial temple, that they, the efficacy of those sacrifices or what those sacrifices are for has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of the revelation of scripture. And the only conclusion I can come to is that those are memorial sacrifices. This is a problem that we have today with some teachers. There's a very famous teacher, and there's a lot of controversy as to whether this teacher is uh, what we would call, uh, believes in dual covenant salvation. In other words, that Jews could be kept today in this period of time uh, by keeping the law. And it's, it's somewhat controversial with this teacher uh, I don't think he's, people say he, he does not teach that, but I think that anything that he's said about it has at best been unclear. Um, but if he is teaching that, he's, he's clearly an error. Paul, Paul talks about in Galatians, if anyone, whether me or an angel brings any other gospel there to be anathema, um, what happens in some aspects, some parts of the dispensational community is they might move that dual covenant salvation into the 70th week uh, after, you know, depending on when people believe the time that the rapture occurs, but that in the 70th week, Jews and Gentiles will be, will be saved by a combination of faith and works and keeping the law and, and sacrifices. Listen, if, it, if it's wrong now, it's wrong in the 70th week, and it's wrong in the millennium. And I think it's a, um, I, I don't know how to say it more strongly that anything else is an insult to Jesus Christ. There's, there's a very practical application to the way these things are. And God is a God of logic and truth. And uh, we have to, uh, and consistency. We have to, we have to start from that premise. And I, I'm very concerned when I see some dispensational friends who advocate this other gospel, this other way of salvation after, in light of what Hebrews tells us so clearly, that Jesus, and what Jesus declared from the cross, it is finished. And I think he meant it. Once people start down that road, it is, uh, it's indicative of the concern I have is that other errors will creep in. Um, because, and this is such a core part of the Christian faith and the people of God. And can I just lead on then to the issues around healing? We're both Pentecostals. And yeah. being Pentecostals, we do believe in that manifestation in the absolute authority and gifting of the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't deny in any shape or fashion of the Lord's healing power, physically, emotionally, no. mentally, whatever the situation would be, the Lord through his grace has shown numerous times in his scripture and witnessed by so many people across the world of his benevolence. Mm. But there's a big difference in the Lord administering that and even empowering people through his Holy Spirit for an occasion, or even, as we call it, giving the gift of the Holy Spirit to actually administer that healing. How do you see the difference in that then, than praying into an inanimate object, in this case, a piece of cloth, where David draws the parallel back to those issues on Straight Street? Is that correct, what David has said? Well, again, I, I, you know, I would disagree with that as a doctrine, um, very much so. Um, trying to be fair-minded from those I've spoken to, um, people have told me that David himself has, uh, this is one of the, the teachings that David has um, suggested that he wouldn't uh, go along with any longer. Um, but I've been there myself, and you talked about us being Pentecostal, I'll be very honest and say I've been in a church um, very early in my Christian life where these sort of things, and it's one of the reasons why I left, fully embraced um, the so-called Toronto blessing back in the day, and this kind of thing was reasonably commonplace. Um, you know, impartation, laying on the hands and so on, and prayer cloths um, and receiving healing from prayer cloths and, and fabric is, you know, something that I've come across quite a bit. 
I think mainly it, it's it's um, a teaching that leans very much on Acts chapter 19, verse 11 to 12. I've got it in front of me. It says this. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. So I think the important thing, uh, and you've already touched upon this, Amos, is that we see even from the scripture, it was God who worked the miracles by the hands of Paul. But moreover, it makes the point that these miracles were not usual. They were extraordinary. Yes. Uh, and so although what I'm about to say next might raise a few eyebrows, bear with me. <laughs> Do I believe that God could impart healing through cloths as he did with Paul? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes, I did. Because the Bible says he did it before and therefore he could do it again. He obviously wasn't against it um, and it wasn't against his character to do no. so previously. Uh, and given his immutability, that means the fact that he, he doesn't change. Uh, I wouldn't expect it to be against his character now. So should God will to do so, he, he, he would. But however, it's unusual that strikes me. So this would clearly... Um, clearly not according to the word of God be a usual occurrence um, which immediately causes me to wonder how one can teach such thing as a doctrine or a certainty that if we do this this will happen it's obviously an unusual event so my first point is that you can lay hands on handkerchief and aprons ties and jackets as much as you like but only God can work the miracle and it would certainly be an unusual occurrence according to the word of God for him to do so in such a way. Secondly, in terms of impartation, by the laying on of hands on the handkerchief aprons and the like, just what is the anointing, the gifting, or, or uh, you know, that one's imparting? Because, of course, there's no power in the fabric in and of itself. And because there's no power in the fabric in and of itself, if there is any anointing on it, it must come from somewhere. Yes. So I don't want to, to, to cast aspersions. And I'm not talking particularly about David, and I want to make that very clear. Yeah. I'm talking about my sort of existence in the Pentecostal church post-Toronto when these things are more commonplace. So certainly not aimed at David, but I would say that if you have a, a, a teacher, a false teacher, um, or somebody who isn't upholding the true gospel of Christ, or simply isn't teaching by the spirit of truth, therefore, uh, what is it? that's being imparted, if anything. Um, and rather than making it personal to anyone, we should consider the doctrine of impartation itself. And what I want to say on this is that it rests very much on the idea, the doctrine of impartation, that, that God has chosen specifically people um, or anointed believers to have a special ability to share or give or impart spiritual things with others. Now, you've just hit the nail on the head. Um, in my opinion, Amos, and, and that's that's completely bogus. That's wrong. The, the gifts come from God. They're, they're spiritual gifts. They're imparted um, by God. They're given by God, by the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's not something that a man can give uh, to another. So from that point of view, um, you know, to suggest if you begin to add things up about it would be a very unusual occurrence, um, it's God who gives the gifts, not a man who gives the gifts, to actually make any kind of doctrine that we could do such a thing, brings us, as what we consider the remnant church, right back to, to, to a lot of error that, that, that many of us sort of came out yeah. of, is that promoting some people to having some extra special ability within the body, that, yes. leaves, us wide open, that leaves us wide open to the charlatans. I mean, and as you know, I've been a missionary in Africa and so on, but, you know, guys who sell um, handkerchiefs and people that you might see on certain television programs who ask for huge donations and they'll send you these things. I mean, this is clearly, um, they're clearly charlatans and, and they, they they trade on these things. And we shouldn't believe that, that we can put our faith in the power or ability of any man to impart these things to us. Our faith is solely in Jesus. And if we are to receive such gifts, they come uh, as spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit um, and they're given by God so you know to actually put our faith in a man being able to impart these things to us you know it, it, it's just a real problem um, yeah. and you know it's, it's, it's a technique and again I, I want to make this perfectly clear I am not attacking David and suggesting that this is David I'm talking about 
the error of, of this way of thinking within the, the church in general is, is that it opens up um, less mature believers or perhaps those who are needy, desperate of healing or whatever it may be, um, to charlatans to prey upon them. And um, we need to know that our faith is entirely in, in, in God in and not in any imposters. Amen. Amen. So, so from that point of view, again, I think it's a problem. Uh, uh, as I said, it may raise a few eyebrows. God has done it. Therefore, given his immutability, God can do it. But even then in the Bible, it says he worked unusual miracles through the hands of Paul. This wouldn't be usual in the way that we would go into some charismatic churches and find that they'd made a doctrine of it. And, you know, we can teach one another mm. how to do these things it would be a nonsense. Yeah. I mean, I, I know for me, when I've looked at this, uh, I've looked at it several times and listened to it on several occasions. Th th there's two phrases, two caveats that David adds to it. One, that Paul prayed into it, and the scripture doesn't intimate or say that in any shape or fashion. And then he goes on to say that once it's done, it's everlasting. Mm. And that then leads us into that situation you correctly, correctly identified, if the power is still in the cloth, then the cloth is merchandise. You can sell mm. it, you can do whatever you want, it's a trinket, you can, you know, you can cut it up and you can sell samples of it like a swatch or whatever. And, and that's the danger for me with that sort of teaching because you're introducing something that the Bible in no way ever indicates. Even if you look at the pool at Shalom, the angel come down once, once a year, and the people waited patiently for it. But this isn't the Shekinah glory, this isn't the Lord's power hovering at any one place and you can reach in and touch it. This was the Lord, as you say, on an unusual, special occasion. And we're blessed yeah. by those things, but we shouldn't take it as the norm and we shouldn't take it for granted, I don't think. Nor, nor perhaps make a doctrine out of no. you know unusual occurrences. So, you know, it, it, the Lord moves as the Lord wills, not as we teach that if we do. And uh, again, let me point out, I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I'm talking about where I've come from. But you know, I've been in church where they've had classes on how to do these things, and yeah. you know, it isn't a case of you can learn how to do this. It's it's, it's God who moves. And he moves in this particular way uh, it, it, to work unusual miracles, the word says. So, Thank you. you know, I think we have to be careful. Mm. There are some huge ministries, huge ministries, and, and um, you know, the likes of Benny and so on, who, who have uh, millions and millions of adherents and followers who, who, you know, would go along with these things. But I, I, I'm afraid, from my point of view, you know, we're meant to be, we, we feed the sheep, not fleece them. and, and <laughs> You know, it, the people have made a business out of this, uh, Amos, and, and it's clearly wrong, uh, and it clearly needs to be pulled up. Now, my understanding is, as I say through speaking with others, that, that this is one area where, 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 where David has said that he, he regrets this and, and yeah. doesn't believe this. Now, whether that's the case or not, I don't know. You spoke with Bill, and Bill knows David far more than, than I, and I certainly haven't come here this evening to attack David. I've certainly just come to to give my opinion, as you've asked me to, on, on some of the doctrinal um, issues, which is why CMFI felt it was necessary to yes, say you. Kant is teaching just doctrinally. That's all the issue is with us. No, I totally understand that, and I respect that, and I wouldn't ask anything else. Why well, my position would be I do not see slain in the Spirit as a manifestation of infilling of the Holy Spirit in any... I, I just don't see it. I, I Personally, I don't know where it came up. I don't know how it developed. Uh, yeah, here we sit. Uh, actually, there's a conference. Amos, there's a conference coming up next year in Toronto called... Uh, something 25 the 25th anniversary of the toronto outpouring where we had all kinds of crazy man supposed manifestations of the spirit from laughing to being slain in the spirit to uh, losing control to barking like uh, to barking like dogs and and other animals um so to me the 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 problem with the slain in the spirit is that it, it it's one of these it's it's i'm trying to think the way to say it. it 
to me, it would be sort of like the entry level drug to other error. You know, we, we always talk about entry level drugs to certain types of addictive drugs like opioids, that marijuana would be an entry level drug. And I, and I think I would characterize it that way is that um, it, it generally leads to something else. Look, if, if I can just sort of swerve off here, um, and I think you're going to ask me a question about uh, like a hanky or something like that as a, an inanimate object that's able to transmit healing power. One of the problems that I have, listen, listen you need to understand my background. I grew up in a... Um, what I would call a cessationist environment, non, non-Pentecostal. Uh, one of my Greek professors in college wrote one of the leading books on cessationism. And I can tell you that there are seminaries today, major seminaries that teach what this man wrote in his book. But I, I cannot deny the power of the miraculous. But I also think the problem is that people take the miraculous things that happen in the book of Acts and things that happen in the book of Acts and make them normative. This leads to tremendous problems. I can take you across town to a mega church of 12,000 people where the pastor, who is clearly deep into the word faith heresy, uh, sells prayer cloths, oil, anoint, you know, all these, all these things to raise money. It, it's wrong. I can take you up the road to show you now the empty lot where a church stood, word faith, con man faith healer, who sold water from the spring on the property. Uh, and he, he eventually lost some of his followers when he was arrested for threatening to kill a, a state cop down in South Carolina. And the man was, he was a con artist. And so you know, the question is, where does it stop once you start down that road? I, I grew up when I was in college. Uh, I was in a small rural community. It was a county of less than 20,000 people. They had a large church in that county called the Glory Barn Faith Assembly. It was started by one of the professors at Grace Seminary. Uh, I went to Grace College. We also had a seminary, Grace Seminary. And uh, Hobart Freeman was his name, and he had gone off into this really one of the more extreme word faith cults that we've seen in America. Uh, people believed that they were healed. Uh, I used to work with a guy. Uh, he almost hit me in the head a couple times in the factory where we worked because he couldn't see, but he had thrown away his glasses, convinced that he was healed, and he his, his sight was fine. And it wasn't. I mean, the the, practic, the practical effect of it was he, he would almost hurt people because he, he couldn't see things or where you were. Babies died in childbirth. Uh, Hobart Freeman himself died of treatable type 2 diabetes. He died of gangrene at about the age of 62. Wow. The, what I saw in this community was a train wreck of people that were taken down the word faith road. Again, my contention would be that the word faith, the fetish objects, these these are, this is on a path that's very, very concerning to me. Just this morning, Amos, somebody sent me a link for Bethel, the Bethel store out in Redding, California, where you can buy a host of, of, of objects to um, help you to uh, a pillow with dream, you know, dreams are made here and or you can realize your dreams a a clicker so you can click how many times you have uh, declared something into existence uh, I think it would also have a dual use uh, dual clicking for how many people have we fooled today here at Bethel uh, by selling these things and and just these objects that you can sell which is there's no, there's just no biblical basis for it. What happened in Acts were things that happened for signs, but they weren't where they were never intended, as I understand it, to be normative events for the church till the Lord returns. What does the Bible say, if anything, in relation to the laying on of hands? Okay, look, what does the Bible say about the, the doctrine of laying on of hands? 
it does happen to be one of the elementary doctrines of the church. Yeah. In Hebrews 6, he gives the basic doctrines. That's one of them. Okay, laying on of hands. Okay, in the Great Commission, he said, you, these signs will follow those that believe in my name. Yeah. They will cast out devils. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's part of it. A, 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 perhaps a greater part of it, too, has to do with endorsement. Who you endorse? Lay hands suddenly on no man. And then there is the whole issue of the story in the book of Acts, chapter 19, where Paul laid hands on people and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to the Old Testament as well, where the priests would lay hands on sacrifices and confess their the sins of the nation. Here's the thing. I came out of the same background that Dave Nathan did, the Word of Faith and the Pentecostal movement. Now, I thank God for the word uh, Pentecostal movement, not the word of faith. That was total heresy. Mm -hmm. But the Pentecostal movement has is, is got validity. We're, at least we're talking about scriptures and scriptural practices, okay? So basically, um, I understand that whole mindset. Now, there's a story in the book of Acts where Paul, uh, handkerchiefs were brought to him, and, and power went into them, and, the, and then people were healed. But it says God wrought special miracles yes. by the hands of Paul. That's not a norm. That's not a doctrine. This is the problem people make. And there's another major false uh, teaching in Pentecostalism that's really taken hold called impartation, yes. where you can, get, you can impart a great anointing on somebody else by the laying on of hands. And the, and the whole system of the new apostolic Re reformation is basically based on impartation of gifts by apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, this is where the Pentecostal movement has gone errant, okay? Uh, in the first place, there are no apostles of the same level as the ones that gave us the Scripture. book of Ephesians 2 says the whole church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay, that's the foundation's already been laid, right? Yeah. Now what an apostle is is merely someone sent to go somewhere. Okay, another uh, scripture that goes along with this is lay hands suddenly on no man. Yes. Now, th now we're actually living this out. This is why Jacob had to distance himself from Dave Hunt or uh, Dave Nathan and distance Moriel Ministry because this whole idea of who you endorse is extremely important, and you don't want to do it suddenly and then regret it later. Okay, we have to have discernment. And we have to insist on soundness of doctrine and practice. So really, we're actually living that now. But, but where David and Nathan has come from at some time, he says he left it a long time ago. Other people say he just recently posted this tape. I don't want to go there, okay? But I know where he's coming from, and that is from the same people that brought us the Toronto Blessing and the Pensacola uh, Abomination and these false, false revivals that have afflicted the church. Yeah. Now, if David is right that he left that a long time ago, I'm happy because I don't want anyone to be involved in that. But th th that teaching somehow or other maintained, and that needed to be repudiated too. Thanks, Bill. Can, can I just confirm then, as you understand it, when we lay hands on somebody, yeah. we're not transferring anything. We're not applying anything that we've got within ourselves or has come through us. We're not the conduit. No. To do anything we're simply doing this no. as a ceremonial if you like application of anointing from the lord it's a, yes in fact in the new testament i mean ordination is like recognition of a call that is evidently there yeah. and the laying on of hands is a way of saying we affirm that this is here okay as for sickness there's the anointing of oil or there's the laying on of the hands of the sick that's just simple obedience word for word to Mark 16 or James 5. You see what I'm saying? Acts chapter 19 shows them laying hands on people who did not know about the more of the Holy Spirit. And they all were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's, that's wonderful, okay? Those things, whatever people think about them, at least we're discussing Scripture, not something totally yeah. crazy. Now, uh, in Acts 19, I believe it is, where Paul, God wrought special miracles, God himself said these are special miracles. This is not something you could build a doctrine on. And in fact, in the Greek, it's in the accusative, okay? It's not that Paul caused something to happen and to go into his cloths. 
It's that God did something. God imputed something on the people, and he happened to use. It's like Peter's shadow, you know. Yeah. Peter went over with his shadow, and people healed. Well, we don't have a doctrine of shadow healing. Okay. Although, give the Pentecostals time, they'll come up. <laughs> know. Can I just then affirm with this, Bill? Because we've all seen the, the charlatans on television, Benny Hill's Benny Hill says yes. his prayer cloths and these other things, selling special water from Jerusalem, and, and all these things. They yep. are just inanimate objects. Exactly. And even if the Lord had allowed on that one occasion for you to actually anoint that piece of cloth that whatever it may be uh, that the tree which is put in, in in the water which sweetened the waters Moses is stand right. whatever it may be that doesn't reside in that object forever and it, it then becomes a museum piece or something exactly. which is holy in itself it's not it's just exactly what the Lord used on that occasion is that the way you see it yes and in, and in fact we have the story in the Old Testament of Nehushtan the very serpent that Moses lifted up on the pole, they made an idol out of, okay? That was a one-time thing God told him to lift that serpent up. But when Israel enshrined that into its uh, its religion, it actually became an idol, and one of the kings was told to destroy it. John, in, in relation to, yes. I suppose what only I can describe as David's biggest controversy in, in relation to the, these recent issues, and the one that really has caused the biggest upset, confusion, and dispute, and I'll say the word globally um, amongst Christendom, the amount of social media traffic and even vitriolic comment from quite a few people in relation to this really has been quite um, upsetting, and it has been alarming to a lot of people who have seen people respond in this way over this particular issue. And that's when David quite dogmatically says, that God the Father created nothing. And then there's a pregnant pause, and it goes into the rest of his message. What do you understand in relation to this on a personal level, as a preacher of the Word of God, what does the, the, the Word itself say in, to, in relation to what the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, as that triune being created, and was there or is there an exception, because of some of the scriptures where it says they were created by or through the Lord Jesus. What do you understand in relation to that? And is David dangerously teaching error here? Yeah, I, I think it's error. I think it's, um, I suppose it's easy for an area for people to be confused. Uh, I mean, I think it's clear throughout the Old Testament that uh, God the Father created things, Psalm 102, uh, other passages, and but you know certainly we we can't deny the fact that Jesus was involved as the agent of creation. That's what John chapter one teaches us, uh, and we also know that Jesus' first miracle was a miracle to sort of um, display God's creative power. Um, so you know I, I see where the confusion can come in. I I do think it's. Uh, I think it's an issue that needs to be addressed, it needs to be clarified so that people are not confused. Um, unfortunately, I think it's, it's there, there's confusion on the issue. You know, it's, it's interesting, I was driving yesterday morning and uh, my iPhone sometimes plays automatically on my car radio or through my car radio and uh, a teaching came on of Jacob. Uh, from about 10 years ago, you can find it online on YouTube uh, on John chapter 2, or excuse me, Second John, Second John, where he talks, it's, of course, everybody wants to say it's the gospel of love, but it's the gospel of really truth and love, that without truth, your your love isn't, isn't really worth that much. And so it's, it's a, I think it's a, it was a, a wonderful admonition and exposition of the passage as to how we ought to approach these things. I'm a, uh, I, I do, I'm an elder pastor at a church, but I also am a trial lawyer, so I'm an evidence guy. And I want to make sure that I got things correct. I want to make sure that I what I present, whether it's in the courtroom or in church, is the truth. And I, um, I know I, I, you know, sometimes you struggle with 
you know, how strong should you be on teaching the truth? Um, I, so I, I think we need to keep that in mind that without truth, the, the love thing doesn't really work that well. The conclusion that I got from that is that God works through a lot of imperfect people, uh, one of which is who you're interviewing or talking to today. And um, I do have to trust that God's Holy Spirit will will overcome whatever imperfections I might have to bless people or to to use the message in some way. I, I recently, you know, I, I got a call a couple of years ago from a lady. I had done a prophecy update. And to be honest with you, I don't remember if I shared the gospel in that prophecy update. And the lady said, I watched your prophecy update and I got saved. Now, that had nothing to do with me, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So God uses our own, God works over our imperfections, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And we need to trust God to do that. In, in relation to our Father in Heaven, yeah. we know that God the Father created everything. And the scriptures quite clearly tell us that it was created through His Son. And the way I look at this, in many ways, to use a modern analogy, is that you post a letter. You're sending me a Christmas card, for example. So you've posted it, and the postman delivers it. David has taught that the Father didn't create anything. And he's extrapolating something out of the scriptures in relation to Jesus. Mm. And Jesus alone created it without either the other parties in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, or God the Father. Is that the way you understand his teaching, that it was Jesus and Jesus working in isolation? Or is there another element to this that perhaps I've misunderstood? Well, again, you know, I'm trying very hard not to make um, comment on, on David uh, individually. Uh, I'd much rather talk about the doctrine, but from, from what I have seen and heard, it is quite an emphatic statement that God the Father was not involved in creation. And I have spoken to others who perhaps, um, once again, maybe don't see that as being overly uh, serious or problematical. Um, and I have to say that of the more, well, I, say, I suppose the issue of the blood is, it, it, it is one that bothers me yeah. because it's bordering on another gospel to suggest that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, isn't enough to save and that we, we will ever have a time when the blood of bulls and goats uh, can can save. But I have to say this one worries me greatly and for people to suggest that it's not a big deal, that troubles me too. For example, our own statement of faith at Evangel Church in Sidmouth, and I think it would probably be uh, on this issue a reasonably standard um, sentiment in uh, or statement of faith, um, concerning the Godhead says this, and I'm going to read directly from our own statement of faith. Yeah, please do. We believe that the Godhead exists co-equally and co-eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that they are one God, sovereign in creation, providence, and redemption. Yeah. So the important thing to remember here is in our very statement of faith, in, in, in our church in particular, and I know it's, it's a very similar wording in many other churches, is that we say that the Godhead or the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-eternal, uh, they're co-equal, um, and they, uh, uh, um, in regards to creation, uh, providence, uh, and redemption. Now, you only have, you don't have to have gone to Bible college. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to. You know, study hard. I've got my Bible in front of me. Let's just pick up our Bibles, if we may, because okay. this is answered in, you know, in scriptures that everybody knows in the first three or four uh, verses of Genesis itself. Let's have a look. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light first three verses of our Bible, we see Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit all involved in the creation. Uh, creation. So in the beginning, God, we can see that the uh, Spirit is hovering over the water. Some might say, well, where is Jesus in this? Well, the answer, of course, is given from John's Gospel, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and we understand that the pre-existent Jesus is, is the Logos, is the Word of God. So that all three, um, men, the fullness of the Godhead, let me put it that way, the fullness of the Godhead is involved in creation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God was there, He spoke the Word, and the Spirit, the Word being Jesus, and the Spirit hovered over with the yeah. water. The fact that all three are involved, and the notion that somebody, anybody, again, not, not saying, but the notion that anybody could suggest that God wasn't involved, when we know by the time that we get down from memory to verse 26, God creates man, that God says, let us create man in our image. Yes. So, once again, we see that the fullness of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is involved in everything. The problem for this, uh, with this, for me, is not so much a suggestion that it was Jesus who created, because, it, fair enough, you know, he did. There are many scriptures that says, yeah. through him, through him, the world was created. But the notion that the thing that I find particularly difficult to, to, to or unpalatable here is the suggestion that God wasn't involved at all, when clearly the scripture says that all three were, and the Apostles' Creed, as others have mentioned before, begins with, you know, we believe uh, in God the Father, the Almighty, creating heaven and earth. So, why are we trying to separate the Godhead, the Trinity? Why are we trying to attribute uh, these different things, that, you know, actions to them? And why are we trying to deny God, uh, the Father, had any involvement yeah. in creation when clearly it does? I think it's Second Peter 3 from memory tells me that in the last days that there will be scoffers uh, it talks about um you know uh, um denying the promise of god you know, though we see that god's not slack in his promise uh, concerning his promise it's not his will that anyone should um perish but it all should come to repentance but two things they 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 scoff the return of the lord jesus christ and it says that they willfully um so uh, creation so uh, willfully stuff creation so h here we have a situation where um how it is meant or intended uh, i'll reserve judgment on perhaps you know perhaps the seriousness of it or, or or the connotations of it weren't thought through perhaps i can be generous enough to suggest yeah. that how i heard it taught though was was quite emphatic and once again, should anyone say, well, I'm not really sure that it's actually a big deal for us to fall out over because, you know, we can find scriptures that suggest that through Jesus that the world was created. But once again, we're right back undermining the fundamentals of our faith because our very statement of faith says that we believe the Father, yeah. Son and the Holy Spirit were involved in creation and the Apostles' Creed. Now, why would anybody, not this particular gentleman, why would anybody want to unpick those things which we consider to be fundamentally important enough that they form the, 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 the doctrine of the Trinity and the Godhead and its um, co-sovereign uh, and its sovereignty, you know, the being co-eternal, co-equal and sovereign in creation, uh, providence and redemption. Why would anybody want to unpick that? Because we're now unpicking our very the building state. blocks, yeah. Yeah. yeah, our building blocks. So whether it's intentional or not, I will not pass comment on. And I'm, I, I've not, neither have I, or to the best of my knowledge, anybody in CMFI on the council have suggested that it may be intentional or, or otherwise. And we haven't got in to any of the arguments that have been going on. But it requires clarification. Oh, in fact, all of these issues require clarification, but particularly from my point of view, concerning the blood and now concerning creation, very much require clarification. And we, in my humble opinion, for what it's worth, need to put aside the arguing and the falling out and who said this and who said that in terms of, you know, subsequent <clears throat> come right back and address the 
the, the real issue, which is, does this gentleman mean what he says or, or, or not? And if the answer is not, let's, let's have um, the truth, let's have uh, an apology, and yep. let's be told once and for all, do you believe that God the Father had nothing to do with creation? Do you believe that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ you know, will have no effect? That there'll be a time when it will stop having effect. If you believe these things, uh, I would have to say that we do have very serious doctrinal issues. And unfortunately, that all the unpleasantness that's gone on around it has um, put a smoke screen up which means that we're being diverted absolutely from totally agree dealing with this. and these are these are the issues that need to be dealt with because the rest you know are are, are in some ways incidental you know and apologize for for saying this or doing that you know in terms of just our um day-to-day -day behavior but what we really need to do right now is is to actually bring clarification to these teachings and i think much of it would go away if we could just so from our point of view in cmfi and again i'm speaking personally as well it is that they are serious enough that we didn't label david a heretic we didn't attack him publicly we made a private internal statement saying we have some question marks uh, questions that are unanswered which give us a cause for concern and until we can clarify these things we can't endorse his ministry to date despite numerous tv programs being made from all kinds of people ev everybody uh, and statements and emails and social media and despite what has now gone on for many many weeks to the best of my knowledge i can't find that we have been given adequate clarity to say that we know exactly where David stands on these very serious issues. These are the things that need to be cleared up for the good of everybody, including himself, um, but also, you know, many uh, sincere believers who, who, you know, aren't quite sure of what to believe. Well, I can tell you what to believe, the Word of God uh, and the one true gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, and again, we really shouldn't be putting our faith in any man at all. And by that, I mean any man. Uh, at all but simply in our lord jesus christ and his word so let's keep this about the word of god let's keep this doctrinal let's try and get away from all these um relationship issues and and let's have some clarity on these things so that we can say we strongly disagree or we understand you've moved your position or whatever but let's it needs to be brought to a conclusion Ian, thank you for that, and I don't think anybody would disagree with that. At, at the end of the day, end of the day, at the end of the day, um, this really shows us that the Lord's grace, His patience, and His understanding is so generous that even issues as serious as this do not in any way prohibit anybody coming back to repent and to allow themselves to learn and to be disciplined. But still loved by the Lord and that door is open to David and it's open to all of us and whether you are in this case an internationally reliant Bible teacher a pastor of a local church or a member of the local choir or a man sitting in your own in a mountain it's the same Lord it's the same gospel and it's the same blood of Jesus that's been extended to us all forevermore that we can come back to him and then gain that access and that fellowship with God the Father so anyone listening to this who might be thinking oh what he said is just it's beyond the pale it's not our Lord in heaven will welcome David back with open arms but we just want David to be really explain to us to the world what he actually meant by the comments that he made I know when he went on GV247 there's criticism of that because it came across as being orchestrated. Okay, set that aside for a second. But what we really need to do is to hear from David and David alone to say, I do or I don't believe in the eternal sanctifying power of the Lord Jesus' blood. I don't or I do believe in the praying into inanimate cloth, whatever, for healing and so on. David, 
we just want to hear from you. You're our brother. We've all met you. We, we want to be able to encourage you to do the right thing, and we have. But so far, that res response has been, well, it has, there hasn't been a response. That's the sad thing. But David, and for those who are closer to David, not just geographically in South Africa and in Bread of Life Ministries, but to other people who know David, we need to recognise that David still needs our prayer. So please do not give up on David. Whatever what happens, do not give up on him and pray for him that the Lord will speak to him and he will surrender and he will come back and he will explain his position. Ian, thank you for your um, openness and your, um, your contribution tonight. Is there anything else you want to say, you feel that you'd like to say in, in relation to this, either personally or on behalf of Evangel or in Simify? Well, I, I think I would only say personally, and, and um, I know you've spoken, well, Bill has spoken already at length, and, and um, I know that Bill has a much closer and stronger relationship with, with David than, than, than I have. Um, I don't know David um, particularly well. Um, I think the points that you were making were, were well made. Uh, I would just like to say I'm a sensitive person and I can imagine that if I was in the spotlight as he has been over the last few months that it must be very difficult for him and I understand that and, and I'm not insensitive to that uh, and I'm, I'm very what we've heard so far though I think has been a, a, a defense of himself and, and I would just say simply that um, right now the issues of, of doctrine are so great. Just think for a moment, not about the protagonists in, 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 yeah. in any conflict within church circles, but sincere believers who, who really need to know and be reminded of the truth. Just come and make a statement and make it very clear what it is that you do believe uh, so that we can sort of deal with this um, once and for all. And, and for, for David's sake, as well as everyone else's, perhaps, as you say, put it behind us and move on in whatever direction it is that we move but let's try and move on from here because i think it's taking up an awful lot of time um but it, it is really troubling an awful lot of people and we possibly as pastors um need to be thinking perhaps more about those people that we're having an effect on that ourselves so so let's 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 spend a little bit more time thinking about those than than defending ourselves um but uh, i'm i'm just very grateful um, for the opportunity to put our point of view at CMFI and say once again that it's nothing personal with David. We don't have an axe to grind with David. We, we know that many CMFI members um, have become very close to David and our issue is not with David, it's with David's teaching. So please clarify the teaching so we can just move on. Ian, thank you. Thank you for the work you do at CMFI and the good folk down at Evangel in Devon here in the UK. There's been a lot of allegation, a lot of rumour, a lot of mistruths, a lot of divisive behaviour and none of the, nobody here condones that and we all challenge it. Right. We know the Lord is the Lord of all and he is in control and that's what we need to understand. Amen. That even with the best intention of you and me and, and, and John and, and, and Ian and anybody else listening to this, the Lord knows how he's going to deal with this the lord knows what's yeah. going to be the result of this but the reality is that we do have this genuine want for it to come and end quickly and for people who've been confused have been sidelined misaligned whatever it may be to actually get right with the lord and that's the whole point and purpose of this tonight is to bring simply back to what yeah. the lord says and in closing on that bill what do you believe is the situation? Can we still walk, and this is a personal opinion, I understand this, can we still walk with David? Are we still walking together in spirit and truth? Or is it as aimless if we can't agree, are we going to have to divide? Oh wow, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, that's a very powerful question. Look, look the, the problem is when you, when you double down on something you could have easily cleared up. Mm. That just tells you the future, okay? Now look, I like I say, I say this with hesitance because I don't like all the barbs and stuff like that and the flings and the arrows that people are shooting at each other. But look, David Nathan has not cleared up serious doctrinal errors. I have challenged him to do it. I have allowed him to post on my blog and on my uh, 
Facebook, and I'm sure other people challenge him to do it. He hasn't done it. So I'm not going to be uh, pursuing working with him. I can't. I just can't do it right now. I'm praying, though. Love hopes all things, right? Uh, and that's the thing, Bill, isn't it? Well, that we need to continue in prayer. We need to continue to, to raise him up to the Lord. And that reconciliation that people keep saying about Jacob and David, that, that's not the issue. The issue is David, oh. our Father in heaven. That's the issue. You're right. This is not about David and Jacob. It goes well, far wider than time. that. Before I go, is there anything else you just want to add as a caveat? Anything else the Lord just laid on your heart in relation to any of this? Yeah, well, I just want to say this. I just want to say this, Amos, to all the listening people. This could have been and still can be a teachable moment. Yep. We don't have to get personal about it. We could just be objective people, take a look at Scripture, put aside personalities, put aside people being rude, people doing this or that or the other. You really want to promote a man who says the Father did not create anything or that the blood of Jesus Christ has no profit at any dispensation? Yeah. This is a serious problem. Yeah. This is not very hard to understand. It's only when it gets obfuscated by the strife, people calling people liars, doing all that other stuff. That's what's made it hard on people. Yeah. But mm -hmm. People have got to remember where their true loyalty lies. It lies with the word. This isn't about Jacob or David. No, I, and I would just might like to make a plea on your behalf because I know that you were drawn into this with people making allegations yes. about you not going to Scotland and all, all sorts of issues, even on Facebook page, people making all sorts of allegations against you. This is a genuine plea to brothers and sisters listening and watching to this. Stop this. This is totally yeah. destructive. Please. It's not edifying the church or any individual. And if any non-Christian or anybody whose faith is weak or in any way learning to walk with the Lord sees and hears this, they're going to go, I don't want anything to do with this. This is just madness. So please, right. brothers and sisters, stop this and leave it alone. You're right, brother. This is end time stuff. This is real strife instigated by Satan himself. Yeah. Across the world, on the World Wide Web, Genesis Christian TV.